Good afternoon and welcome to this concurrent session on local partnerships for social and affordable housing development. This session is being live streamed, uh, so I also welcome our virtual participants. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and those that are with us today. I would also like to thank our session sponsor, Civica. My name is Humair Ahmed. I'm the Director of Community Housing at the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. Um, I'm delighted to host this session because in my current role, I do broker and manage a lot of these local partnerships uh, with councils, with community housing providers, with various state government agencies to create affordable housing supply. We have very successfully combined our grant programs with contributions that councils and community housing providers can bring. Uh, councils in terms of um, planning levers and land in many cases. Uh, community housing providers, of course, through uh, debt and equity. So you must have heard about the capital stack or the layering or the proverbial lasagna <laughs> that eventually leads to uh, social and affordable housing outcomes. So th these partnerships are critical for creating that. So this session is about those partnerships. So throughout the conference and generally, we hear a lot about uh, you know, major reform and significant injections of funds uh, to, to solve the housing crisis. But in the absence of that, there's a lot of local partnerships that are happening on the ground. Um, and um, they, they happen irrespective because of the ingenuity of the local communities, not-for-profit sectors, philanthropists, councils, community housing providers. And I acknowledge that you know this this session is going to focus on some of and highlight some of those initiatives. So uh, this session is the only session that's standing between you and the conference dinner. So I'm really quite aware of that fact. And this is a uh, second day of the conference and a late afternoon session. So I'm really thankful that you're all here. Uh, we'll make it as uh, interesting and interactive for you as possible. And that will be a very easy job because we have a great uh, set of presenters today with very interesting uh, things and insights to add. Uh, and um, you know, uh, feel free to uh, use the app to uh, ask questions. Um, we want to make it uh, a really uh, interesting session, and it wouldn't be interesting without your input. Um, so um, before we kick off, um, I just wanted to say that uh, the, the details and the bios of all the speakers today are on the conference app. In the interest of time, I won't be reading through them, but I would encourage you to definitely go online and check them out. Uh, and see what the good work all, uh, all the wonderful participants are doing in their respective fields. Uh, so without further ado, we might kick it off. Um, our first presenter is uh, Kate Breen, our Director of Affordable Development Outcomes. Kate, would you like to come to the lecture? Hi, thank you everyone um, for coming to this session. Uh, it's been really pleasing to actually see the question of what role local government might play in a number of um, questions in other forums. So I'm hoping uh, what I talk about today um, is just a little bit of um, the jigsaw puzzle and that it um, is thought provoking and inspires you to um, connect with local governments or if you're a local government, think more about how you might play in this space. So I'm really focusing on how local government land might be provided into an affordable housing um, space. And I really want to acknowledge that um, today I'm talking um, and drawing from a lot of work that I've done in partnership with Moore's Legal, um, uh, Auspiced by the Community Housing Industry Association of Victoria in partnership with the Municipal Association of Victoria. Uh, and that's a um, resource guide that I'll talk about um, at the end of the presentation. I also want to really um, also acknowledge that the great examples um, of local government land being used for affordable housing that I'll illustrate throughout this presentation uh, is full credit to the local councils and housing agencies that are delivering those projects. Um, and I hope they also so inspire you. So as we all know in this room, there's many elements that go into the delivery of affordable housing. Many of those are really what already happens in res standard residential development, um, but there's also those other layers, um, in particular the need for funding or subsidy. We also know that different layers of government, but also the private sector and particularly the not-for-profit sector can play a role in this space. 
And as I mentioned, I really want to focus today on well, what's the potential and uh, opportunities around land, specifically land that is currently in local council uh, stewardship. Some of the uh, context, well, we know local governments are clearly very community um, driven. They are, are social planners. There are land use planners and planning authorities. They're also asset owners. They own everything from small parks, car parks, through to grand town halls. They are also really close to the need on the ground, um, but they have very limited capacity to directly invest and respond to the challenge. Um, and it's really, I guess, not been their primary role to be developing and managing affordable housing. Uh, and do acknowledge there are some um, historic examples and still some active examples of how um, councils managing very small amounts of affordable housing, but it really isn't their primary um, responsibility. On the other hand, we obviously have community housing organisations who I don't need to tell you all have a very strong purpose and mission uh, and capacity in this space. They also have access to the financing and funding um, when it is available and the connections um, to support services for tenants that, that is needed to achieve this outcome. They face the dilemma of uh, limited sources of well-located and affordably priced land, ideally land that comes at no cost. And they also have a constrained and competitive funding environment. So there's a real opportunity here to connect those opportunities to utilise um, underutilised or surplus local government land to respond to local community needs, to draw on that community housing agency purpose and skills and capacity, and to bring together different levels of government investment, but also private and social investment to achieve what you know, we're all here talking about um, at this conference, to realise affordable housing, but particularly also localised housing responses, um, to, to deliver partnerships and co-investment that also has a social return, but also has social and economic return, most critically for the residents. So I suggest in looking at this space that there's a number of shared objectives that local councils and housing agencies share, um, clearly to address the demand with new quality affordable housing supply, to support the most vulnerable and, and very low and low income households, to ensure the viability and sustainability, not just of the development um, process and, and the resulting sustainability of a development itself, but the operations and the community, both within any one development and, and the wider community sustainability. To also ensure that investment is secured in public purpose and that there's appropriate risk um, from either side or risk sharing. In working in this space, um, I think it's also important to recognise that there can be um, different objectives that in the process of looking at bringing local council land, um, there needs to be some balancing, there may be trade-offs um, to achieve the outcomes. And I just want to touch on a couple of those um, that I certainly see kind of play out a little bit in Victoria. So from a local government perspective, often there's a very strong objective and desire to retain ownership or title of the land that they're dealing with. That land has been owned um, by the council typically for a very long time and there's a very strong connection to that. There may also be a desire to achieve a financial return if the council decides that it is happy to dispose of land or divest in it. Um, and also to ensure that if social housing outcomes are achieved that they are retained in the local municipality effectively in perpetuity. Community housing organisations clearly need to attract the funding and financing to deliver the projects. Uh, and critically, that typically requires them to look at what security they can provide to their financiers for lending purposes. And they're also looking at how they can ensure value to attract the government investment um, and needing to align opportunities um, to develop with the funding opportunities. They're also bound to follow their regulatory requirements and prudentially manage their investment and ensuring both project viability and organisational sustainability. Um, just want to highlight that these aren't insurmountable challenges or differences, but they are points where there may be some tension in the process of looking at how local government land might be um, provided that will need to be kind of thought through in the process and may need um, you know, one objective to be lowered in order to achieve the, the overarching objectives I talked about on the earlier slide. 
So the key questions, um, other than of course, uh, what land do you have and how might it, um, you know, what can it achieve? I think, uh, well, how might you as a local council actually provide land into this space or what I refer to as your delivery model? And how could the value of that contribution um, be secured over time? There's a whole range of things that organisations will need to think about in this space if you're to look at putting in land. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's not a simple process, but also what I'm trying to highlight here is if you start to break it down into different elements, um, there's a range of expertise that councils might bring in in the first instance around um, design, uh, for instance, planning. But there's also a range of um, considerations around financing, feasibility, funding, and critically, the ownership and control over the land and the resulting asset. We also clearly need to take, councils clearly need to take into account the community views. So I'm just gonna to touch on now four different um, delivery models that a council that may have land, hopefully you're out there, um, might um, apply to realise affordable housing in partnership with a community housing organisation. So the gifting of land, it's obviously pretty self-explanatory, involves the transfer of title, could also um, involve the title to property above the ground, a ground floor, is what we call um, air rights. And that's clearly an optimal model for housing agencies because they don't have to pay for that land. It gives them the title so they can use that to borrow. They also have the long-term development and redevelopment potential of that um, site. The key challenges clearly are that it transfers that control out of the, the council. Uh, it has been referred to in parts of Victoria by some councils as privatisation, even though it's, uh, I'd argue that's not when it's going to a not-for-profit, um, but that is um, uh, seen as not acceptable. And there is obviously a risk that the site could be sold in the future. Um, that can clearly be protected through um, legal mechanisms, but just on its own, if you were just a gift with no other control, there is that risk. Sale at, of land at a discount, I suggest there may be some circumstances where councils may consider this, and that could be selling the land at a discount to a housing agency or to a private developer with an affordable housing requirement. Um, there is a, quite a few challenges, and from a um, you know, procurement and um, process sense, there's a lot more that a council would need to think about, um, not least what discount and what affordable housing outcomes if they're selling to the private sector. Um, and it's definitely less attractive um, just from a feasibility point of view from a housing for a housing agency. On the flip, sales to a developer may also face a lot more community resistance. And it clearly faces those same challenges as gifting around losing title and control. Uh, this is an example of um, a site in Melbourne, in the city of Whitehorse, uh, where land has been sold at a discount um, to just illustrate the kind of circumstances where that might um, occur. And as you can see, this is a very large development and it was sold uh, to a consortium of MAB Corporation with Housing First um, to develop into a mixed tenure development with I think around 70 or 70, just over 70 um, social housing units. So a third model that's um, been used by a number of councils in Victoria at the moment is around leasing. Um, and that's clearly where council retains the title and uh, I put it a discount and really talking peppercorn. Um, you know, they're, not, they're not actually getting a financial return, but at the end of the lease period, the land reverts back to full council um, control, potentially also the assets. There's a number of challenges here. Um, the housing agency would struggle to use that land asset for borrowing because the bank can't secure its lending against um, the land. And there are going to be opportunities that are going, you know, a housing agency with limited resources will weigh it up against other opportunities where they do have that full control. Um, and a really critical issue becomes, well, what is the management process of tenants at the end of that? Um, term, who has responsibility, both practically, but also I think from a public perception risk management point of view. The other model, which is actually two, joint venture and partnership are actually quite distinct legal um, terms, uh, is actually not something I've seen yet, but I think as we get into looking at what assets councils can provide um, and 
the affordable housing space is clearly getting a lot more sophisticated and evolving very quickly. These are, these are models that may be attractive in certain circumstances. And it's really a partnering approach and that means that the two organisations um, are working out a joint venture type structure perhaps um, where they're sharing the, the journey um, really as collaborators and partners, but they're also sharing the risk and they're sharing the reward. It's definitely more complex. I'd suggest this type of um, arrangement might work where, say, a council wants to redevelop a public library and uh, they want a new library, but they're also able to give the air rights to a housing agency and there may be infrastructure type funding that can come in to support that. That might be where a joint venture type approach um, may be appropriate, such like a city deal. Um, it will still ultimately require the parties to work out uh, what happens with the affordable housing assets. Are they leased? Are they gifted to the housing agency at the end of the development? Are they retained within a joint venture vehicle that's co-owned by the parties? So the other part then is that the, the, these two questions kind of sit alongside each other. How do we provide our land as local council, but also how are we making sure we secure the outcomes we um, want? And for some that could be, how do we secure this land um, in affordable housing purposes forevermore? Um, I suggest it's also a good, that we should also actually be thinking about this um, a little bit differently and that it's not just about that piece of land, it's actually about the value of the council contribution. So the value of the gifted land or the discount to land. Um, or it might be about the actual affordable housing outcome in terms of number of households that are supported for a period of time. And the reason I raise those points is it is really important to remember that land has um, both other non-monetary value to councils, so as I said, it um, you know, can have a, I guess, a um, very close attraction to a piece of land that's within their area, but also strong views around retaining it in ownership. But that land is only one part of the development equation. So providing land on its own won't uh, suddenly result in affordable housing. All of those other funding and financing inputs are really critical and that's obviously what the housing agency is bringing or attracting other investors to and they need to then be um, making sure they're pr appropriately both attracting that investment but managing it over time um, as well as their regulatory requirements. So how the land's provided affects the feasibility and uh, in turn, you know, the project, um, whether the project will succeed and how that council contribution uh, is valued and held in that process. So just draw on here, um, the Victorian government's own land use policy guidelines um, talks about definition of public value. And just, I guess, reminding us that it's not just about an economic value that, you know, the value a general places on highest and best use on your piece of land, that clearly councils are actually thinking about other um, outcomes. And uh, it was great to hear that Chi is doing work around um, this in the, uh, in the earlier session. So the last part then is, well, how might you secure your contribution, not your specific piece of land? Um, and there's a couple of different ways that a council could look to do that. Um, it could accept that housing agency is a not-for-profit um, organisation, the charitable purpose, um, is sufficient comfort that that, um, that there's no other tools required, that that's what the housing agency is there to do. If they ever wind up, their assets go to a like-minded organisation and that that's actually sufficient comfort. I think that would be a great place for us to get to, and, but it might take some time before we're there. They could also look to set up um, a special purpose vehicle. So some, some councils have set up um, a housing trust, for instance, the Port Phillip, Phillip um, housing trust being the longest running um, successful example here in Victoria, um, or it may be another form of special purpose vehicle. They could just do it through legal agreement, which could actually translate. Um, we have a section 173 agreement um, in Victoria, it can be placed on land, other jurisdictions would have something similar. So that requires the land to be used for a certain purpose, maybe for a certain period of time, or it may be until the parties um, decide to negotiate a new agreement. Uh, other emerging models could be looking at a mortgage instrument where you translate the value of the council land into essentially an equity 
um, holding so that if the land was ever sold, uh, the council would essentially be paid back a proportional um, value, a proportional part of that future value depending on what the land was in the first instance. So I don't actually unfortunately have time to go through all of these models in a lot of detail today, but a resource is coming soon. Um, it hasn't yet been uh, released, it's you know, at the printers, uh, but as I mentioned, Chia Vic and MAV with funding from Homes Victoria engaged myself and Moore's Legal to put together a resource guide that's really intended to unpack these ideas of how councils may provide their land and how they may secure their contribution and give a pretty detailed analysis of those options to save you having to do it. It's also um, intended to support community housing um, organisations look at options and engage back with local councils around which options might suit them um, best. And please uh, register with Chia Vic's newsletter if you're not already and you'll get the information um, and the resource guide. It, it will be open source um, and other than a very small reference to uh, Victoria's legal framework around the sale of land, I, I'd suggest it could really apply um, across Australia and you just need to make sure that obviously there's certain requirements councils have um, when they look to sell their land. And the final um, part I'd just like to talk about, which I referenced earlier about, we have council land opportunity, housing agency purpose. We still need the funding part to make it happen. Um, so I guess so just to leave you with a little bit of a thought bubble around how that might work, um, where we can bring in, uh, in this instance, I'm talking about a state government um, that may have its own criteria about where it wants to invest that identifies a specific um, funding stream to apply to local government land and puts particular terms around that funding and looks at a specific process in the first instance to potentially invite councils through like a registration of interest to submit sites um, that they would be interested in putting into an affordable housing purpose. Then we'd obviously have local councils, many who are already looking at asset potential, doing their own criteria, identifying sites, uh, looking at how they might release those sites and uh, put in, in submissions back to the state. The result of that, that process, I would hope, would be um, a dedicated funding stream for you know, maybe up to a certain amount of number of sites or outcomes per year, potentially some sort of agreement like a heads of agreement between the council and the state. Uh, and conditional state support subject to a housing agency proposal. So the state would not be committing to how much they would fund, that they would actually fund, but really they're saying that site in that location meets our criteria and we would welcome an application from a housing agency that meets your terms and conditions council. And then importantly, a streamlined process that still ensures we tick the procurement boxes because now we've got two levels of government that all have processes around procurement, um, but really tries to streamline it and maximise the value that can come. And so that kind of process would look like local councils, you know, finalising their terms, tendering out to the housing agency, um, potentially doing early community engagement, uh, the housing agency clearly responding to that, doing their due diligence, coming up with the beautiful designs, um, looking at the, the legal structures that might be entered and tendering to council. Uh, the point then council makes a, a decision to essentially shortlist. There may be public notice requirements. There's you know, some probably more in-depth community engagement. And that clearly leads then to support for the housing agency. The housing agency still needs the government money, but they've got a streamlined process. So they would hopefully have a feasibility um, process that is actually already replicating what the, sta the state wants. And so it would be a simple process Ideally, I'd love to see this on a rolling basis. So it's a bit like first in, um, you know, housing agencies get in, uh, the state would confirm their funding. Uh, we've got things like streamlined planning approval in Victoria for this. And then the final contract comes together. So that's just a little bit of a thought about how do we bring those funding land and housing agency processes in to realise these outcomes. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think my first fail as a facilitator, I wasn't a very good timekeeper. <laughs> 
Uh, but I think um, th there are not that many questions. I think I haven't seen any come up. Uh, but I have a question before we invite the next uh, speakers. Um, my in my practice in New South Wales, the problem we the problem I think most councils face is that they are not set up as housing agencies and uh, they're not resourced for it as well. So while there's a lot of good intent and they really want to create affordable housing in their council areas, they just don't have the resources. I think there's always that need for an integrator or someone to come in and form those partnerships. I think that's my feeling. I think uh, we, we provide that kind of support, uh, you know, with the limited resources we have, but I think, um, uh, is that, is that, has that been your experience in Victoria as well? Or? Uh, I guess I'd say that it's not the housing, that it's not council's role to be the housing agency. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I know New South Wales has got a little bit of councils in this space and that that's, that's the expertise the community housing sector can bring. I think probably, again, where maybe the state could support is a little bit of capacity building funds. And, and we did have a little bit of this actually a couple of years ago in Victoria to help councils engage the consultants to give them that really early um, due diligence assessment, essentially, like what's a kind of basic yield outcome, how much is the land valued, um, really high level, but enough for a council to make a decision on do we go to the next gate, which is actually then to invite the housing sector to do the more detailed work um, and engage their architects and actually you know, housing agencies n will do the, the needs assessment, all of that. So I would be, I, I guess uh, my response is, this is what the ho community housing sector is there to do. Um, and it's probably more about council just having the resources to manage the process and managing the political side of the process. Yeah. yeah. And, and also approval. how to operationalize it, how to make it happen on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the resource constraint is. So uh, I think with that, um, I would like to invite Erin um, Dolan, uh, David Toscano, and Tim Riley. I think you're playing tag, Erin. Uh, uh, and Erin is from the Lord Mayor's uh, Charitable Foundation. Uh, David is from Northern Communities Church, uh, Church of Christ. And Tim is from the Property Collective. Thank you. Everyone can hear me all right? Um, so I'd like to start uh, on behalf of my two co-presenters and myself to, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, we're going to um, talk a bit about a practical example. It's great that Kate um, went first. And perhaps um, more than an example, we're going to um, talk to you about the journey to date about a parcel of land in Preston and our um, desire to build affordable housing there. So um, my name is Erin Dillon. I'm from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. We are the uh, community foundation for Melbourne. Uh, we support the critical issues facing Melbourne, and next year is our 100th year anniversary. We have five impact areas. The one that I work in is homelessness and affordable housing, and what we're trying to do there is prevent homelessness or pre preventing entrenchment into homelessness and increasing the supply of quality affordable housing. And to that end, we began an initiative called the Affordable Housing Challenge. Um, to encourage landowners to build affordable housing on their underutilized land. Um, uh, our first one was in 2017, um, and that was with local councils. So um, Kate and I have presented before on this topic. Um, you'll see the beautiful concept design there from a site in Darabin Council, um, and Housing Choices, a community housing provider, have, were successful with a long-term lease on that. Uh, it's currently under construction. Um, the Affordable Housing uh, Challenge was created through a partnership at the Affordable Housing Hallmark, which is the name now of a, a group based at the University of Melbourne. Uh, the foundation funded the university to create the housing access research tool. I recommend you take a look at this on uh, the web. It um, is free to use. It maps all sites in Greater Melbourne and puts a ranking on them from zero to 20 based on their access to amenities. So that's um, schools, employment, public transport, uh, green space, et cetera. Um, in, 
2020, once we'd solved the um, issues with local councils, we um, uh, decided to expand and um, see if we could encourage not-for-profits, including faith-based organizations, to um, better use their underutilized land. Um, this, uh, this was always an idea, but in 2019, we actually were approached by a small community housing provider for a small grant to redevelop a disused nunnery. So we had an inkling that there was a desire for this type of grant. Um, and we, uh, as well as doing, running a capital um, grant, we also ran a feasibility grant. So we suspected that there were people who uh, weren't as uh, far along on the journey and that they may want to m want more help in exploring the possibilities. Um, we ran that program in 2020 and in 2021, and I can say that both of those grant programs were um, uh, uh, overutilized. We had more grants than we expected. Uh, I'm going to end that there. Thanks very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over to David. Thanks, Erin. Um, following the amalgamation of four churches, Northern Community Church of Christ uh, moved to our present location at 81 High Street in Preston um, in 2004 to see how we can better engage and more, um, have a, a more positive impact in our community. While the site at Northern was uh, purchased by Northern, it's held in trust uh, by the Churches of Christ Vic Taz and their property corporation. As we know, the built form can either distance or better engage with its surroundings. And while uh, the purchase of a site which has its historic ties with uh, leather goods manufacturing and clothing, um, it may seem a bit of a disconnect, uh, Northern saw it as an opportunity. Uh, we saw it as an opportunity to further steward uh, carefully uh, the site so that we can help people to live their best lives possible through the activation of 81 High Street. Integral to that was the plans for us to return to this site to continue our mission. Uh, key to this is Northern's vision, um, which informs our outcomes. Our vision statement is that radiating out of our community and residential centre in the city of Darabin, Northern Community Church of Christ will be a faithful Christ-centred community to seek um, to live life well for the benefit and blessing of the community and the world in which we live. In 2020, Northern Community Church uh, Care Works with uh, property collectives, um, and Tim's representing them today, uh, successfully received a $50,000 grant from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation to provide a feasibility report on affordable housing um, development at this 81 to 91 High Street Preston site. It was a unique opportunity for us to further realise our mission. Rather than standing at a distance um, that's nice and safe, uh, Northern has a boots and all approach to building community with those who live in the apartments above us, as well as uh, committing to care for the poor and the marginalised, helping those who have previously faced limitations um, to embrace opportunities to live their life well. Rough sleepers finding a place of safety and welcome, people living in homes without electricity um, can find a nutritious meal with us. In the last two years, we've safely provided in the middle of the pandemic over 6,500 food hampers to households um, and thousands of low and no cost meals to our community. For us, by retaining the um, the ground floor within the Northern Village, Northern Community Church of Christ would continue to build out on our mission um, and to uh, see the, the community centre through shared meeting space, uh, commercial kitchen, retail space, uh, meeting pods. Uh, these would be used by children's activities, um, support services, training space, a maker's shed for repairs and maintenance in an attempt to stem the flow of a throwaway economy, hosting startups and social enterprises, helping people above and also around us to live their life well. Through careful stewardship, we believe that we can partner to achieve the vision of Northern Village on this site to be um, a growing, vibrant centre in the Preston community providing an outward facing facility to extend Northern Community's mission with secure, comfortable homes for a diverse residence group focused around the central town square hub and community hub at its base. 
Now, before I hand over to Tim, um, on the next slide, we're going to see a QR code. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about the feasibility study and what um, was prepared there, uh, then feel free to pull out your uh, preferred smart device and uh, have your QR code reader ready. And I'll hand over to Tim. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. So I'll talk a bit about um, the feasibility study itself. So in terms of the objective and process, um, really our objective was to protect the book value of the church's asset while enhancing the social impact for community. In terms of the process, we introduced a plan of work uh, that was disciplined in defining the vision and included a robust development brief. So we did spend a lot of time with David and his leadership team understanding really clearly what were their functional requirements and what areas um, and relationships between those areas that, that the church was after. Um, it was really important for us to test uh, these requirements in words and numbers at the start of the process. So by the end of the process, we could look back on that and say, hey, have we, have we achieved what we were looking to, to achieve? Another important aspect was understanding the residual land value of the church assets. So while, while the church had an understanding of what its book value was, um, obviously in a development um, um, in a development sense, you know, land will have different values depending on what that development outcome is that you're looking at. So we looked at different development scenarios um, from speculative through to um, a build and hold scenarios through um, and, and then also anal analysed what the commercial cost or opportunity cost of the ground floor um, program was. Um, and we thought this was really important to articulate to the church what the different trade-offs are looking at different development models. Um, another um, factor in, in how we uh, approach this was looking at separating the design envelope um, that the site um, presents in terms of its planning, um, plan the planning controls, as well as the commercial structures and the financial modelling to identify the most viable pathway. So we examined all conceivable development options from speculative to affordable and social housing uh, to try and work out what was the right pathway for the church. Uh, to do this, we developed four key design scenarios. So we looked at schemes of between 80 to 140 apartments. And from this, we generated 14 different financial scenarios till we got to what we th think is the most viable uh, pathway for the church. And that ended up being scenario C8. Um, so th throughout this process, we, we were also very conscious of staying abstract um, and staying in the numbers before commencing any detailed design development. Um, because we always knew that um, once we understood what the strategy was, um, engaging with the uh, community housing provide, uh, community housing providers um, it meant that they could overlay their unique um, uh, needs and, and requirements over over this core feasibility study. So this is um, uh, this is the church's preferred ground floor um, program as, as a starting point. Um, so you'll see that, you know, we have a, a number of requirements here from the church, from op shop to um, uh, offices to um, a maker's space, um, to have some open space, a commercial kitchen, um, and, um, and obviously circulation. And this is an example of what we um, put forward as what a, a, a speculative developer would look to um, prosecute on the site. So, you know, the, di the difference here is that you've got the minimum amount of commercial space fronting High Street, um, and the rest of it has been converted into residential. So this is, um, I suppose, an example of us um, spending uh, the money from Erin's grant to analyse a number of different development scenarios uh, to ensure that as we worked through the process with the church, um, you know, the church was comfortable that we thoroughly investigated every, um, every opportunity. These are the four key design um, 
uh, scenario. So the top two uh, all apartments um, and have sort of minimum commercial, maximum commercial on the ground floor. And the bottom two involved um, uh, having some townhouses on the panhandle uh, and apartments on the main part of the site. And again, having minimum commercial um, and then maximum commercial. This is a render of where we've sort of ended up in terms of what we feel is the most viable um, sort of design response from the church's perspective, um, which ends up having the church um, divest part of the site um, to protect uh, their asset book value and then retain control of around 1,400 square metres on the ground plane um, and then develop their air rights. Um, so what we're looking at at the moment is a, a project of around about 80 units with a, a future value book value of in the order of $40 million with, from, from what we can see, enough development margin and yield on cost to make the project viable. Uh, over the, towards the end of last year and the start of this year, we, we conducted a market sounding with a, a few CHPs. Um, we issued them a term sheet with the church's requirements um, and in a commercial engagement framework. Um, and our starting point on preferred structure was a 20 to 30 plus year ground lease with rent um, with a mix of affordable and social housing. Uh, the market feedback was that there was a general preference for strata um, and a capital grant for social housing. Uh, a couple of renders of what we think the built form outcome could uh, look like. So next steps. Um, we're pro progressing with the project and, and looking to form a joint venture. And we are looking for a values aligned community housing provider uh, with development capacity to JV with. Um, we've identified a potential partner and we're now exploring progressing uh, to participate in the build and operate um, big housing build grant round um, uh, in the middle of this year. And we're also preparing to conduct now a more detailed design work to finalise business case modelling for investment committees. In terms of key learnings, um, the first one was really that um, the foundation funding was, was critical to enable a structured and methodical process with a consultant team um, and to allow the church, I suppose, to, to find a consultant team that um, was really working in the church's best interest. Um, so everybody's uh, objectives have been aligned throughout the process. Um, the grant also has enabled the development of what we think is a pretty replicable process in terms of how we've approached this. Um, so that's another positive out of the grant. Um, strong client side vision and leadership has been imperative and, and you know that's kudos to David in terms of the way he's led the process internally with the church. Um, and you know the vision I think is a pretty compelling one um, for, for CHPs to, in, to engage with as well. The third, third point there is, you know, obviously demonstrating residual value of the church's asset from a development perspective um, was really important, I think, for understanding, uh, for internal buy-in uh, amongst the church in terms of understanding what the, the trade-offs are and what the best pathway is for the church to follow. Um, and again, point four, um, particularly when um, grant funding is scarce, um, and you know this early feasibility work is quite uh, is really around strategy. Um, you know we were really careful to not delve into detailed design work too early until we'd really um, worked out what the, what the numbers were indicating. And the final point I suppose is you know we did start this journey um, wanting to explore whether a ground lease uh, was possible, um, and through the journey I suppose we found that it is difficult to progress. Um, this innovative sort of structure in the current environment where you know, the CHPs are resource constrained and the grant funding rounds are the main game. So it does seem from an innovative structure perspective you know, that we're sort of in an evolutionary and maybe not revolutionary environment. So Tim, thank you. So we are running slightly over time, but a few questions have suddenly arrived. So I was getting nervous for a second, and then I did something, and then now I have questions, which is fabulous. Uh, so I think the, the questions I have are mainly for Kate at the moment. Um, I might quickly ask you, Kate, but two questions, similar theme. It's mainly around um, what do councils do when they don't have land? Mm. And um, 
they, I think a lot of councils want to partner with CHPs, but you know, don't, don't have the means to do that. Mm. Um, but of course, there are other things available to them in terms of planning levers, but do you want to sort of elaborate on that quickly? Yeah, um, I mean, City of Port Phillip here is a fantastic example of how you can use car parks. And I'm guessing that when councils say they don't have any land, I think if you investigate, there would be pieces of land, they just have another use. Um, Planning is obviously the other space um, and onwards with voluntary planning negotiations we go in Victoria and they are getting outcomes. So, you know, I think with the right strategy and approach to engaging with developers, you can absolutely secure outcomes on from the private sector. Um, they may not be as big in percentage terms as your aspirations may be, but they are certainly, um, you know, the, the private sector, many developers are not shying away from that space um, and you do hold the planning tools, um, particularly in rezoning. So I think that's really the other, and then continue to advocate and use your voices around things like mandatory contributions, you know, probably in other jurisdictions. <laughs> Thanks for that. And very quickly, Tim, I had a question for you. Uh, you mentioned towards the end of your presentation the ground lease model, and uh, that that kind of sort of the way I understood was that you still need that grant funding, which is more important than just a lease, and that lease probably doesn't give providers enough to actually create supply. Was did I understand that incorrectly? Or well, the the feedback is that you know the grant funding rounds. Um, are a competitive process and so you have a better chance of uh, getting grant funding if the deal looks more vanilla yeah. um, and a strata, a strata deal is more vanilla than a ground lease. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a trade-off between um, wanting to do something and making something happen versus holding off and, and maybe, you know, looking for other partnerships to, to, do, to do things down the track. Yeah. Um, um, you know, under, under a more innovative, innovative structure, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Um, we might move along. Uh, the questions are coming in, and I'll just try and sort of uh, blend them into the discussion as we go along. Um, our next presenter is Michelle Robeson from Lennon Housing Corporation. Um, Michelle, that's your cue. Thanks very much, Hemir. Okay. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands we're meeting on today, including those out in the online virtual world, and to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge Aboriginal colleagues in the, and leaders in the uh, audience today. I have to show that because our comms person will be very cranky with me if I didn't show you our new branding collateral. Um, I've done the acknowledgement of country. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, two policies that we developed um, at the end of 2020 as part of the way that we, one of the many ways that we are um, increasing the way that we partner with community housing providers in New South Wales. So the Land and Housing Corporation owns the New South Wales government mainstream social housing portfolio and is responsible for managing and um, looking after that portfolio. We sit in the Department of Planning and Environment, which is a slightly different model to a lot of other jurisdictions. We, uh, back in 2011-12, the land and property and asset management functions were separated from what was Housing New South Wales and placed into a separate entity. Um, so the other um, parts of the housing portfolio in New South Wales sit with the Department of Communities and Justice, which is responsible for the overall uh, system level policy, uh, community housing, sector policies and sector development, and also tenancy management services. We uh, recently had a new Minister for Homes appointed who also has the, uh, the planning portfolio and we are working under the, um, the portfolio and direction of, of the Minister for Homes. 
Uh, the other entities that sit within our division are the Aboriginal Housing Office and also a Housing Policy and Innovation team, which is responsible for the New South Wales housing strategy. So we have over 125,000 properties. Um, the value is well over $50 billion now. And around 25% of our portfolio is managed by the community housing sector, which is over 30,000 properties or around $11 billion um, worth of housing assets. The remainder of the properties, as I mentioned, are managed um, pub as public housing uh, and the tenancies are managed by the Department of Communities, Communities and Justice and we have a partnership agreement um, to oversight that arrangement and the Land and Housing Corporation, or LAC as we are known, um, provides $100 million a year to DCJ as part of their service delivery. We also have around 1,500 crisis and transitional housing properties in the portfolio. Our funding context is really important in, in this presentation around these policies and why we have them because land fundamentally is our, is our major lever. We don't have a lot in the way of capital to contribute to, um, outside, to our partnerships with community housing providers. So we're pr predominantly self-funded, uh, generally not government funded except for the recent stimulus investment. There was about a billion dollars invested over the last two years during the pandemic, um, which we um, were able to uh, utilise quite a a significant portion of, some of it went to the Aboriginal Housing Office and some uh, to community housing for maintenance. So our funding sources have, there's two streams. We have the rents from public housing tenants for the GC, that are DCG managed tenancies. And we utilise that funding to manage our operations and to provide maintenance services and to manage the portfolio. So salaries like mine are paid through that stream of money. Uh, we also then use property, this, the, the revenues from property sales to support our new supply pipeline and to deliver capital upgrades to properties, bathrooms, kitchens, etc. So as I said, land is our major lever. In terms of the challenges, um, there's a lot of people in, there's quite a few people in the room here that probably are familiar with these challenges. They're not unique to New South Wales. Our portfolio is much older and bigger than needed. It's not well aligned to need. We have a lot of family sized homes that are under occupied because increasingly we need homes for single and often older person households. I think about 80% of the social housing wait list in New South Wales at the moment is for one to two bedroom households. So we've got this mismatch. We've also not got a lot of flexibility in the portfolio in terms of what, how we can utilise the land and property to renew and generate new supply. Um, over 60% is on super lots. So they have complex titling and uh, utilities arrangements that are very costly to split up. And we still have quite a lot of homes on estates. Uh, we're working through a, a, a deconcentration program like other jurisdictions. Um, and we have other things that constrain um, our portfolio and also add to our costs. So we have about 7,000 properties which are um, subject to some kind of heritage or uh, conservation status and they are very costly to maintain. So partnering more with community housing providers is important to us in going forward. It was, it's a key message that came, that's included in our 20 year portfolio strategy which we developed at the end of 2020. The portfolio strategy is focused on growing and changing the portfolio so that we can house more people uh, in better quality and modern homes, smaller homes, and much better matched to needs. And a key element of the portfolio strategy is to use our land more wisely. So one of the ways that we've looked at doing this is to utilise the new direct dealing approach um, that the New South Wales government um, was developing. We got out ahead of that and developed some new policies. Um, they've been out there for a year now. We've been testing them. 
But basically, to touch on what direct dealing means in New South Wales, it's an element of our procurement framework. It's defined as exclusive dealings between government and a non-government entity over a commercial proposal. So it's got quite a broad capture. Um, the reason that direct dealing is done is to create value and leverage unique and innovative ideas, projects and initiatives in, that will ultimately provide tangible benefits for people and communities in our state. Direct dealings can be solicited or unsolicited and we can only use direct dealing when a competitive tender is not appropriate or possible and where the entity that we're direct dealing with or considering direct dealing with is in a unique position to deliver. So last year, the government released the new direct dealing guidelines. Previously, we'd been working with guidance from the Independent Commission Against Corruption, um, but we didn't have a formalised policy and the guidelines have now set out some clear expectations in the context of the procurement policy. Um, the, the four elements that are required for direct dealing uh, a really clear justification that aligns to the policy intent, robust and fit for purpose governance arrangements, comprehensive evaluation processes, and appropriate, appropriate approval processes. So why is LAC interested in direct dealing and developing these, why did we develop these policies? Well, our, our policy contacts actually sets up a really strong foundation for us to be working much more partnering more and more often with community housing providers. Housing 2041, our state housing strategy, has a really clear focus on growing the sector and understanding the role of the sector into the future. Future Directions for Social Housing, again, is, has a strong focus on partnering with community housing providers and CHP is having a much stronger role in the system going forward and our own portfolio strategy has articulated this as well. There was an obvious need prior to the policies being developed. We didn't have a formal policy for encouraging proposals to come forward, for managing them and for responding. And often what was happening is that they came up against the only process that we had in New South Wales, which was the New South Wales government unsolicited approvals process and hit the first gateway. And found, we found it difficult to take them forward. And the reason being is that that process requires all proposals to be unique. And we know in social and affordable housing that often proposals aren't unique. They generally need to be replicable, replicable and scalable. And so they were hitting this barrier um, and not being able to go forward. So we developed the policies to open up more opportunities for community housing providers to bring proposals to us. Um, there's also potential for us to approach providers with proposals. And the key change with the new direct dealing approach is that they only need to be in a unique position to deliver. So it doesn't actually have to be a unique solution. Um, we wanted to provide a streamlined process. We've been watching just in terms of our own and other processes that there's quite a lot of investment in the sector that goes towards bid costs and so looking at ways that we can minimise bid costs so that we see more resources going into the actual delivery of social housing and affordable housing um, was really important to us. We assume it's a very important thing to the sector, but at the same time, we have to maintain robust priority processes and a focus on ultimately on value for money for the state. So the policies were unique for us. We developed them as the direct dealing guidelines were being developed. And so now that the direct dealing guidelines are out, we're in a position where we can review them and update them. We've already made some minor changes to one of the processes for the small scale policy um, so that it's a little bit more streamlined. We are in uh, preparing to go out to consult with the sector. We're gonna release a survey very soon to all CHPs and Aboriginal community housing providers to get their feedback on the policies and ways that they could be improved. And we'd be looking forward to hearing the views and seeing how we can uh, adjust the settings to deliver the types of outcomes that we jointly want. So this is, finally we get to the policies. <laughs> um, so the policies, as I said, were developed late in 2020. Um, the two top ones, 
the policy for CHP-led redevelopment and the policy for small-scale direct dealing are the two new policies. The unsolicited proposals process I've already talked about, I won't go into that, but it was creating a barrier for proposals to come forward. The CHP-led redevelopment policy enables proposals with a project value of up to $25 million to be put forward to redevelop for tier one or tier two CHPs to redevelop properties that they lease from us um, in exchange for a long-term lease. And there's some flexibility about including adjoining sites, et cetera, if there's potential to help that with the feasibility of the project. The small scale direct dealing has a much broader focus. It's for transactions up to $5 million. And again, tier one or tier two CHPs can put forward small scale commercial proposals involving land um, to us where they're in a unique position to deliver a solution. It can include sale, redevelopment, lease, uh, or purchase. There's a whole, it's not constrained in terms of the type of commercial proposal. So basically, in terms of the assessment, we have to be able to articulate, and the CHP needs to be able to articulate a clear rationale for direct dealing, it needs to align with all of the government policy um, di directions related to housing, and the benefits clearly have to outweigh the time and expense of a market-based approach and ultimately demonstrate value for money. We've had two successful proposals go through so far, one involving the sale of land for a um, crisis and transitional housing project and another for a small scale redevelopment of um, an old site and the CHP will be uh, delivering eight new two bedroom duplexes and managing those under a, a 20 year lease. So that's it for me. Um, I'll hand back to you. Yes, Come thank in. you. Thank you, Michelle. So I'm still looking at... Thank you. I'm still looking at questions, and I'm worried that they might not be showing up on my screen. Oh, there, they, there you go. Getting a few more. Um, so the question for Michelle is, small scale direct dealing, why limit to tier one and two and not tier threes? It's a really good question. Uh, when we were designing these uh, policies, we recognised that they were unique and we also didn't have the coverage of the New South Wales Government Direct Dealing di Guidelines, so I guess we took a relatively conservative approach. In the review, we'd be really keen to hear about the sector's perspective on any of the policy settings. So we're open to hearing about that. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I think there's no further questions. Um, so let's move on to the, and I, I had one question which you answered in your presentation. Oh, so. excellent. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our next presenter, our final presenter. Uh, our final presenter is Catherine Budden. Catherine is from, the, from Development Victoria. Thank you. And amazing to see everybody here today. And I promise to be very quick, keeping in mind that, yes, a lot of people do definitely want to get to the dinner. So for those who know me, probably know that I take a very different approach to many things. And this presentation is not going to be much different to that. I want to look forward and see how we best can work together to deliver a resident-centred housing approach. And we've spoken a lot over the last two days about the value of housing being treated as social infrastructure. These are critical outcomes for us. Throughout this session and this conference as a whole, we've heard learnings and seen some incredible success stories. We've talked about government policy at all levels and how the sector can partner with government and other industry players. We've considered economic commentary, and Jane Caro has introduced us all to a very different way of looking at elasticity. Surprisingly, that's actually something I'm going to come back to. So over the next 15 minutes, I just want to share some experiences and consider how we can potentially move forward. Before we end today, we will have looked at some challenges and constraints that face both government and the housing sector when trying to partner and work together. We'll consider our common drivers, our objectives, and the factors that impact the growth of the social and affordable housing sector. 
how do we actually work on achieving a resident-centred approach? And what's missing as well? Then finally, how is Development Victoria responding? At the end, we'll touch on a couple of forward goals and maybe some opportunities of how we can all potentially partner together. The role of Development Victoria. As the Victorian government's state development agency, we combine commercial expertise while focusing on achieving government, social and economic policy outcomes. And we do this for the benefit of all Victorians in mind. Our mandate is broad and it covers urban renewal sites, priority precincts such as Docklands, the revitalisation of central Dandenong and more recently Fitzroy Gasworks the development of housing outcomes for all Victorians, making sure that the communities we build are diverse, inclusive and sustainable. And we partner across government to deliver some very significant and outstanding civic projects, such as the Melbourne Park redevelopment. But specifically when we think about affordable housing, Development Victoria has set itself an exciting yet challenging target. Working with government, working with the sector, and also working with the private development market, we are committed to making sure that 25% of all our dwellings are affordable under the objectives of the Planning and Environment Act. This is our first step towards achieving a resident-centered housing outcome. But what are the challenges and complexities that face all of us, and how can we do this together? While the objectives of delivering affordable housing is shared for both the government delivery agencies such as DV and the housing industry, the complexities we face are significantly different. But first I just really want to comment on why I say resident first, not tenancy. Simply because Development Victoria does deliver affordable housing outcomes for all Victorians. This includes rental outcomes and also market home ownership products. We see that all residents are equally deserving of a home and of that opportunity. But if I think about our challenges, we exist, similar to New South Wales and every other state government land agency, in a way that our transaction environment is very restrictive and it needs to be and it should be. This is a requirement for us. We operate in this regulated environment. We have to apply the requirements of the Victorian Government Land Transactions Policy, which sets boundaries for us around valuations, how we can go to market, and also how we can structure our commercial outcomes. In comparison, and I don't think there are many people in this room today who can say to me that any two social or affordable housing transactions look the same. The sector has a need for agility when it comes to transaction structuring. How you align funding requirements, the expectations of, of the debt position, and also how you tailor the transaction to the specific project outcomes and the timing. So how do we do this? How do we merge these two very different outcomes and requirements? Well, we focus on the social and economic objectives that we all commonly share. Our joint policy objectives is to focus on the resident first. Find a way of meaningfully increasing social and affordable housing stock across Victoria. And DV is responding to this and supporting the housing sector by providing certainty throughout the development cycle, which in turn helps the housing sector more effectively apply the funding available and the resourcing to support your delivery. But our common drivers extend considerably further. It's agreed that we exist in a significant time of change, and we've discussed this ad nauseum over the last two days, and I don't think any of us would ever be sick of continuing this conversation. We've seen that we live in a world that the pandemic has not only transformed our lives, but will have an impact for lasting generations. Every day there is commentary about housing, the criticality of affordability, the criticality of the importance of homelessness, and how do we respond to this? But almost by contradiction, and this was raised last night at the plenary, at the very, almost every time the same masthead will tell us all about the value uplift of housing. They'll speak to us about the commoditization of housing and how it is a critical and important wealth generator. 
But honestly, the narrative is changing. And this conference has showed that. We are starting to see government at all levels seeing social and affordable housing as essential social infrastructure. We are focusing more and more on the needs of the resident rather than just the built form. Speaking for Development Victoria, that might be challenging, as it would be for any developer in the room. But in response, we are transforming and we're driving innovation. We're seeing an unprecedented level of funding in Victoria through the big housing build. We're challenging the way we put money into the sector endlessly. We're focusing more on the needs of the resident, not the built form. We are transforming and driving constant innovation through this. The collaboration of our sector on a daily basis and the new ideas that keep coming forward are monumental. For example, just the other day, yesterday actually at the conference here, had a chance to speak to a member of a regional council and talk about how their specific needs for expanding social and affordable housing and what it can do. All players of government and our sector and the industry are working together. We're looking at different transaction models, looking at different housing cohorts and the specific responses that they need. What is a response to homelessness? The housing first principle there. What is our response to key workers, targeting creatives, Aboriginal Australians, neurodivergent needs? We heard earlier about the LGTBIQ sector. I could go on. We've heard about co-housing and we're exploring that. We're exploring build to rent and we're also exploring concepts around rent to buy, just to name a few. But we have a multi-billion dollar question. And that is how do we have a meaningful impact, impact on the supply of social and affordable housing? And how do we bring the resident to the front of the conversation? Fundamentally, we do this by changing the narrative. It's not about who owns the house. It's about who lives in the home. We need to keep the discussion going about the contradictory nature of wealth generation through housing and our need to build and grow a constant stream of social and affordable housing. On a specific delivery front, we're all getting better at consistency. Consistency of land supply, of transaction structuring, funding expectations, timing, delivery, and whose role we have to play. But more work needs to be done about the mechanisms to unlock the value of the created asset for the social housing provider and other ways that we can provide alternative revenue streams for the housing agencies to support the work that they do. And I'll come back to Jane Carrow's theory of elasticity, and that's what I'm going to call it. But I'm not going to apply it to resilience. I'm going to apply it to the housing continuum. If we keep stretching the housing continuum and focus just on market housing supply and the capital growth component then, the stress and the tension point that we will continue to put on homelessness, social housing and the lower end of affordable housing is just going to create a dynamic that the housing continuum will snap. Development Victoria, like all land agencies, has a mandate to respond to increased supply of affordable housing for all their communities. And in doing so, we're hoping that we're going to ease the elastic tension that exists. But we all need to work on preventing families and individuals from entering the system, entering homelessness and needing that critical and high needs support. And we do this by focusing on who lives in the home. The other thing I briefly wanted to discuss, and I know that I'm coming out of time, is discussion around the economic benefit to society over the provision of social and affordable housing. It was touched on last night, and it's something and a conversation that we need to continue to have. We talk about the, the cost of the dwelling, the built form, the benefit of the jobs created through that construction cycle, and then we stop. Why? We don't need to do this. We need to factor in the whole economic value life cycle, the benefit to our community, 
the second, third, fourth order economic value that having people in their own home in a stable environment provides us. This is our role, everyone here, to spark these conversations about how we can drive value and how we can get to the best outcome for a partnership. Finally, back to Development Victoria. And what are we doing to respond? We continue to respond to the challenges of housing affordability. We do this by supporting government policy and focusing on doing it in an economically sustainable way. We are continuing to work closely with our valued colleagues at Homes Victoria, DTF and other central agencies to meet government's policy objectives around social and affordable housing. Every day we are innovating the way we deliver social and affordable housing. And there are many of us within the organisation that are, have this front of mind every day. Our objective comes through about increasing affordable market stock to take the tension again off the housing continuum. How can we enable communities and how can we build communities that are sustainable, that are economically viable and that are affordable? How can we integrate into our communities an environment that suits and meets everybody's needs? which means that we are expanding into the support and the delivery of social housing stock. We're constantly testing new and emerging housing models, such as affordable build to rent, and more recently, as I said, directly partnering with Homes Victoria and the social housing sector. But more critically, what we're doing is growing our relationships across government and the sector, and also with the investment market and the, and the development sector. But we're always looking for ways that we can take tension off the housing continuum. So how do we keep the momentum going from here? And what can we all do? We can maintain the conversation. We can keep the door open to conversation and listen and learn to it from each other. And that's what the last two days have been about. We can focus on the constraints. We respect each other's boundaries. And we focus on coming to a common outcome. I come back to my earlier point about making sure that we create an outcome where we're not looking at who owns the dwelling, but we're always, always focusing on the person, the family, who lives in the home. Collectively, we need to agree that we treat social housing and affordable housing as critical infrastructure. And we've seen that conversation start. We need to believe and treat it as a principle that in turn has an end-to-end -end social economic value to our communities. And the resident has value. Putting a resident in a home has value to everybody in our society. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, a question from both land-owning entities that are on this panel, um, and you can take turns answering that. I think there's a fundamental tension for your organizations in seeking a commercial return as well, because you're the custodians of the government's asset base, but as well as you, you have a social motivation as well. And how is that tension managed? Um, because if I, if I think of, um, say, sales policy, especially for a lot of government agencies, you are expected to generate a market return. But of course, if that sale goes uh, to, say, a community housing provider, uh, is, there, is there capacity? And you mentioned innovation and a lot of other uh, things in terms of releasing the tension of the elastic band. I think, are there, are there avenues for, say, Homes Victoria to uh, do concessional sales or look at innovations coming from the sector? Well, speaking for Development Victoria, um, we are required to deliver an economic return for the state. And it is a tension about how we apply policy outcomes. And it is something that is front of mind every time there is a land transaction. But again, it, it is about putting in place an understanding about the social value and the policy position of providing affordable housing. We have it in our mandate to deliver 25% as affordable. And in doing so, it does allow us to sort of alleviate some of that economic pressure. Oh, that's really good. Uh, Michelle, similar question. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing to note in our agency is that every 
dollar that comes from selling our, our land or properties goes back into the system. Um, we are constrained in the way that we can sell uh, properties. We, we do need to sell for market value. That's a government property uh, policy. Um, but there is some flexibility around selling to organisations with a social purpose, which of course um, community housing providers are. Um, but for us, we tend to sell properties that are only um, considered not fit for modern use as social housing, um, or where we can see that by selling them, we can get such uh, a significant gain, we can develop much more supply. So the Miller's Point sales, which obviously were quite um, contentious in the community. This for those people outside of Sydney, Millers Point, very close to the harbour, a lot of old heritage, large heritage properties, and a lot of families who had lived in them for a long time um, from um, maritime families, etc. Um, and but the sale of those heritage properties gave us the capacity to actually deliver another four properties for every property that was sold. So for us, that's the focus, is how do we use this, the sales proceeds to actually grow supply. Yeah, and it's good to hear that you know, the doors are not closed. You would obviously look at transaction by transaction, any innovation that comes up. Yeah, yeah wherever we can within the constraints of government yeah. policy. Yeah. And obviously, you know, we, we'd like to see um, government policy flexibility where yeah. we can, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I think I don't have any further questions popping up. Um, so that could be a very good reason to formally end the session, because <laughs> I think uh, we'll be all um, sort of uh, tired. Uh, it's been a really uh, good conference and very engaging intellectually as well. So uh, with that, I would thank my panelists. Thank you so much for your insights and inputs and, and the participants of the session. Thanks for your questions and your um, uh, quiet listening <laughs> of the discussion. Uh, I'm sure we've all gained a lot from this session. Thank you so much. <laughs>